I, so I'm, I'm, I'm about to, just give me a second. We're gonna get we're gonna get started here in a second. We're about to shift this thing into gear. But I, you know, whenever I was reading these words on this song, it made me. It kind of was going along with what I felt a certain feel to my message was pertaining to. And sometimes, you know, whenever we're reading songs or singing songs, I don't know that we always pay as close attention. Maybe I pay too much attention to things. I don't know, but. When it's about Jesus, I don't think you can pay too much attention. Amen. It says right here that Jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us. Amen. Amen. Now, now, you know that that's the gospel message. Yes. That, that mankind was born in sin. That's what the gospel states. That mankind was born in sin and that he needed to be redeemed. In other words, he needed something done for his sin because he was separated from God. That's why Jesus was slain for us. Son of God and son of man, you are high and, high and lifted up and all the world will praise your great name. Do you, do you know this morning that not the whole world is praising the great name of Jesus Christ? Now, do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know people that you work with. You know people that you live in the same house with. You know people that you, that you live life with, whether it's who you work with or live with or go to the store and meet up with the people from your that Not everybody's praising in the great name of Jesus. I'm not even saying that not every that most people don't believe Jesus was real. We don't even need to get into all that right now. That would be way too deep. But what I'm trying to say is, are they praising the great name of Jesus? Do they really believe, amen, what the word of the Lord says about salvation and what the word of the Lord says about Jesus himself? I do believe that a big part of what my message is talking about this morning has to do with that. Whenever we're growing through life and we're facing certain situations and the things that we go to, you and I as believers, I'm assuming that most people in here this morning believe that Jesus is real, believe Jesus Amen. died on the cross yes. for their sin. Amen. Yes. Hopefully you've received Jesus into your heart. What does that mean, preacher? It means that you came to the realization that you were a sinner and that you needed to invite Jesus yes. into your heart and ask forgiveness of your sin. If you haven't done that this morning, you're going to get an opportunity before we're done to do that. Amen. Amen. But hopefully you've done that. Hopefully you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And now the enemy is on the prowl. I'm just going to be real with you. Once you become the child of God, once you become a follower of the Lord, the enemy is on the prowl and he wants to try to destroy your faith and he wants to make you turn away and to go in a different or opposite direction. It says that the whole world is going to praise his name. It may not be going on today, but one day the whole world is going to yeah. praise his name. One day the whole world is going to realize that this whole story about Jesus was real. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, and one day the whole world is going to be convinced of that. And they're not going to have a choice but to give him glory. Yeah. And the whole time that we're on this earth right now, once again, the enemy of our soul is trying to convince us that that's not real. That, that really living for Jesus isn't the way that we ought to go. That we're going to find happiness or fulfillment on another side somewhere else doing something else. And I'm here to tell you that this isn't anything new. We're, gonna, we're about to get started in the, in the book of Numbers. But I wanted to tell you that, man, God's will is that Jesus would be proclaimed. That Jesus would be exalted. Amen. Amen. And that the whole world would praise the name of Jesus. Now, I'm about to write something on the board. I hope that whenever I do that, I don't lose you. Who who likes school when you were growing up? Mm -hmm. Oh, like Sean, yeah. I, I knew Sean. She, Sean. Me and Sean think alike. So what I'm trying to say is that I did not like school when I was growing up as a kid. I was a rebel. I didn't pay attention. You know, I wanted to I said, stick a tack in my teacher's chair. I was bad. Like, that's not a good thing. I know. Don't do that. Okay, that's not a good, I'm just telling you, that's kind of like the student I was, but Jesus changed me. Amen. 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 Praise God. I didn't want to learn like that, but now I want to learn and I want to understand. And so all I'm trying to say is, is that sometime when the teacher would go into deep teaching, I would kind of tune her out. I didn't want to like really listen to what she was saying. So I'm trying to ask you, don't tune me out for a second. I just want to put you in the place of the Bible where we are. And you know, this whole scripture or this whole passage that we talked about on the song talked about the fact that that God wants the world to know about Jesus. Amen. And I got to tell you something that a lot of times people 
have not read the Bible enough to understand that from the beginning of time until the end, whenever, whenever God wraps this whole thing up, his whole purpose in all of this has been to reveal Jesus to a lost and a dying world. So what I'm trying to say is, is that if you feel as though maybe you're watching on video, maybe it's somebody in here to this morning, you feel as though there hasn't been any meaning to your life, maybe because the main part of the puzzle has been missing. Because if we live our life for everything that everyone else is living their life for and we're not being convinced that the whole purpose that we're here is for Jesus, then we're missing the main point and we're going to continue to feel a lack of fulfillment and a, and, and a feeling of emptiness. So what I'm here to tell you is, is that we're talking out of the Old Testament and I want to remind you of what the Exodus is is if you don't if you already don't know it has to do with the, with the children of Israel whenever God parted the Red Sea you remember that Amen. see they were Egyptian slaves this correlates to Christians for you and I today to understand the Old Testament isn't outdated no the Old Testament we can find Jesus yeah. in the midst of the Old Testament God's so good like that that he wrote the story more than more than one time and, and more than one way so that you and I could become convinced when we study his word that he is real and that his purpose is to reveal Jesus to a lost and dying world so that Jesus might receive the praise that he deserves amen right. so whenever the Red Sea parted and God's people what was the deal they were slaves in Egypt you remember that yeah. but God delivered them out through the Red Sea and he delivered them from slavery. I'm here to tell you that when you were born of your father, Adam, in, when you were born from your mother in your physical birth, the Bible teaches, you just got to take my, my word for this right now because I don't have time to break it down for you. In the New Testament, in the book of Romans, Colossians, it's throughout that you and I were born in sin. Amen. We were born a sinner in our physical birth. None of us are good. That's what the word of God says in the book of Romans. People don't like this kind of preaching, but I'm here to tell you, this is what you're going to get when you come to church here. The word of God says, none are good, none are righteous, no, not one. Their mouths are like an open sepulcher, which means a tomb, meaning that oftentimes what's coming out of our mouth is death. When people heard the way we spoke about other people on the backside, they would hear that we're not lifting people up. We're not encouraging them. We're not trying to strengthen them, but instead we would rather see half the time people fall on their face and fail. So that we can feel better about the plight or the situation that we're in. I'm here to tell you that's not the way Jesus looks. Hello. Jesus laid down his life so that people could have hope. Yes. So the first time you were born, you were born in sin. You were born like your father Adam. You were born with a sinful nature. That's why the word of God teaches man must be born again. Hallelujah. Amen. How are you born again? Jesus came to the earth. He was the sinless one and he died on the cross in, in our place and he died to pay the penalty of our sin and when we hear the gospel which means good news the word of God that says that we were born sinners but that says we can be born again how through simple faith through simple faith that God the father made a way and what was that way he sent Jesus and what was his purpose to send Jesus to pay the penalty for our sin and when we realize that by faith and say, yes, God, I accept your way. Please forgive me of my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Teach me your ways. Now I just beginning the journey of Christianity, beginning to understand that this whole life isn't about me and what it is that I want. That's just an introduction. Now I got to get up every morning and I got to start walking with the Lord and learning the Lord's ways. And the only way to learn his ways is to learn this book right here. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, he unfolds the meaning of the words within this book and he begins to teach us the heart of God. But what we've learned all of our lives, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, what we tend to have learned all of our lives is what others have taught us. Come on, somebody, help me out. My, my grandparents taught me some things. I learned how to play boo from my grandparents. I'm not t picking on you on the boo ray. I'm you just hear the point. I learned certain things from certain people. But I didn't learn the things of God until I got saved and I got into the Word of God. My grandparents taught me certain things. My daddy taught me certain things. 
but he didn't teach me the things of God, right? The, the people I went to school with taught me certain things. My friends that I hung out with taught me certain things. The people that I work with tried to teach me certain things, but what the Lord's trying to teach me is the word of God and his culture, and there's going to be a day when everybody's going to praise the name of Jesus, and the question is, will we be in that multitude? Yeah. Will we be in that group that has made the decision to live for him in spite of all of the things that we face and the circumstances that we went through. So I'm trying to prepare you for the time frame of the Bible where we are right now. The children of Israel came through the Exodus. They went through the Red Sea. That's kind of like our salvation experience because when we were born physically in Adam and born sinners, we were born slaves, like a slave to sin. Okay. You know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about when I say a slave, born a slave to sin? Have you ever found yourself in the midst of a situation or circumstance that you didn't like where you were? Like you felt like it wasn't really of the Lord for you to be there, but you couldn't pull yourself away from it. Or anything in your life that was actually causing harm to you and you could not just walk away from it and be free from it. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and start listing them all out. I'm just asking you to tell me whether or not you can remember a time when there was something stronger in your life than what you were and you couldn't. See, that's what you call the power of sin. There's actually a scripture that says in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I'm here to tell you that there's a spiritual law that says Jesus dying on the cross has given us access to the spirit of God that is more powerful than anything that you and I are facing today. And the Lord can and will because he wants to to deliver us. Amen? Amen. And so in this Old Testament story where we are, the children of Israel have come through the Red Sea. And so it's like they've been saved. It's kind of like, I guess you would say where you and I are today if we're saved. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can kind of like nod your head like, I'm there with you, preacher. I've been born again. I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I'm struggling. Well, guess what? Children of Israel struggle. What is this? Oh, this is like a little circle. They just went in circles. They was in the wilderness. This wilderness experience, I'm probably going to run out of chalk. So we'll just call it wild. <laughs> Nowadays they say they were wilding out. They were in the wilderness. And they were going in circles. What does that mean? Because see, a lot of times whenever you're not walking the way that the Lord would have you to walk, you're going in a direction that you're not supposed to go. You start to feel frustrated about that direction. You come back to the Lord and you're like, Lord, please help me. He does a work to your heart. You repent. You turn. You go back towards the Lord. And then the next thing you know, here comes another situation. And you start going in the opposite direction again. And the next thing you know, you're kind of like the children of Israel for 40 years walking around in a wilderness, going in circles, never making it to the intended destination that he had for you. So the intended destination that he had for them was a place called Canaan. Uh-oh. Yeah. I saw the box of chalk that Manny bought me and I left it in my car. He, the plan that he had for them was to bring them to a place of Canaan. I know this is a lot of information. Just, just bear with me. Later on, God would change the name of this place to Israel. And that's what we know today, right? When you look at the map, when you watch Fox News, CNN, whatever your persuasion is. They talk about this nation called Israel, all right? This was always God's plan because ultimately from Israel, what did we get? We got Jesus. See, Jesus. So when you look at the big plan of God and you read the Old Testament and you read it from cover to cover, what you begin to realize, God had one big plan the whole time. And what was that big plan? That you, worthy is the name of Jesus, amen, and you will be, all the world will praise your great name. It might seem like it's taken a long time for us to get from point A to point B, but I'm here to tell you that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. And God is committed to the plan that he is enacting and bringing about, amen, and what that plan is is this. He's provided salvation for you and I. Right. He's provided hope for you and I. He's provided a way for you and I to be able to have a relationship with him and to experience eternal life, joy, and happiness as we're going to spend the rest of our life with him. 
Part of the problem that we run into, and I kind of tell you that I preach a lot about this because I guess maybe I'm dealing with it too, like we all are. Part of the, part of the situation that we deal with though is this, is that we oftentimes are, get to a place in our walk where we're willing to forfeit our eternal inheritance for some happiness right here. Good. We're willing to give it over. You see what I'm saying? But, but, but man, it's not working the way that I expected, man. It's just taking too long. What if the Lord got tired of the way that people were acting and he gave up on his big old plan? Uh, listen, I'm not trying to fuss at you. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just shooting straight with you. Lord, we, Lord, we need grace. Amen. In order to stay faithful to you and to your plan, like you've been faithful to your own plan. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go. Ahead. So that's where we are. This is about, I don't know, I guess you could say that this is about 1400, something like that. Maybe 1200 BC is where this story is. So where we are in the, in the Old Testament is this is before the children of Israel have entered into the promised land. They have still been walking around in this wilderness uh, going back and forth, right? And God's going to speak to Joshua and Caleb. That's really the two main characters of our story this morning. And I really just titled my message something simple like this. Which side are you on? Amen. Let's go to Numbers chapter 13. We're going to start reading. It's kind of a long, uh, a little bit of a long passage of reading, but just bear with me. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. Now, before I don't want to stop each time and give a whole lot of commentary, because I'll keep you here all day. But I do want you to notice that the Lord said, I'm giving this to them. This is my gift to them. For the children of Israel, I have allotted a portion, and I'm giving this to them. And what I'm here to tell you, it's called, it's all, Canaan was also known as the promised land. And I'm here to tell you that God has promises for you and I located within his word, amen. But whenever the people go to spy out what God has for them, they see things that they weren't really expecting to see. All right, you with me? All right. Numbers 13, we're going to jump down to verse 17, and we're going to read verses 17 through 21. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they're strong or weak, whether there's just a few or there's many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it's good or bad, what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents, or in strongholds, in other words, a strong building that it would be hard for us to overcome versus a little tent. And what the land is, whether it be fat, in other words, it produces a lot, or lean, there's not much there. Whether there be wood there or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. And now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men came to Hamath. Now we're going to go down to verse 23. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. Now what they want you to see here, if you're not paying close attention, this was a big old cluster of grapes. The fruit of the land. I don't know how to describe it. Is this hyperbole? No. Like, and what is hyperbole? Like a bunch of language to make it look like it's better than what it was? No, I'm here to tell you it's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord said that this cluster of grace was this big. That's how big it is. We don't have the time to get into all the scientific things connected to it. But I don't know about you, but we've seen pictures of some big old pumpkins out there. Some big old squad before like, wow, look at that pumpkin. It weighs 400 pounds. I'm here to tell you that right here during this time frame, there was a cluster of grapes that was so big that two men had to take a pole and tie this cluster of grapes and they had to carry it like this with them because that's how much fruit there was hanging on the vine. See, God was saying, I want you to go spy it out. I want you to see what I'm going to give to you. I want you to see the promises that I have for you. I want you to see that this land that I'm giving you is a good land. Amen. And that there's something there that you're going to want. Go, let's go ahead and go on to verse 24. The place was called the Brook of Eschol because of the cluster of grapes with the children of Israel cut down from there. 
And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them, unto all the congregation, that means the whole multitude of the people of God, and they showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came to the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. And I want you to imagine this, milk and honey. I mean, look, this may not seem like a big deal to you, but look, if you don't have a Walmart in your neighborhood and you got wild goats running around and you can just grab one of them things and milk it and get you a bucket of milk, you're doing good. If you can walk and listen, if it's flown with honey, you know what that means? There's just beehives all over the place and you can literally see gold honey dripping from trees as the sun hits it. And if there's honey like that dripping from trees, that means there's flowers everywhere with all kind of pollen for all. It's, it's just beautiful. It's lush. It's full of produce. It's a place that's blooming and it's full of life. And that's what God has prepared for his people. Nevertheless, here's the but. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. God has a great land for us. God has good stuff for us. There's all kind of milk. There's all kind of honey. But, and big old clusters of grapes. But... The people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and they are very great. And moreover, oh my gosh, we also saw the children of Anak there. We don't have time to get into that, but Anak was a giant. The Bible talks about the fact that he was a giant. He had multiple offspring, and his sons were giants. And these guys were very, they were tough. But you know what? Whenever there's a David in the house, that's what David, David says, yeah, well, one rock's going to drop you to your knees. I'll take your own sword and cut your head off. Yeah. What I want you to know is a big part of my message this morning is how we're perceiving the things that we're facing, how we're perceiving the battle that we're in the midst of. He says the children of Anak are over there and the Amalekites, they dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan and Caleb. I love this guy. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Caleb stilled the people. You know, he said, shh, be quiet. <laughs> Has anybody ever done that to you before? Like you're talking and they hush you. Boy, that'll get your flesh wild up. <laughs> Did you just shush me? <laughs> yes, he shushed you. He told you, shh, be quiet. Because you're speaking negative. You're speaking, you're looking at the glass as half full. You're not looking at the glass, I'm sorry, glass is half empty. You're not looking at the glass as half full. You're looking at how big your enemy is instead of looking at how big your God is. Caleb said, hush. Yes. He said that before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But then the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. Not, we're not focused on the dripping honey. We're not focused on the wild herd of, goat, herd of goats. We're not focused on all the beautiful flowers and the big old cluster of grapes. No! The inhabitants thereof, they're huge. They're men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so therefore, that's what we look like to them. Verse 14, chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron the whole congregation said unto them, would God or I wish that God would have let us die in the land of Egypt. So I wish he would have just let us die over there in the world when we were slaves. Or would God, I wish God would have allowed us to die in this wilderness even. Why, wherefore or why has God brought us into this land to fall by the sword? <laughs> That our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? Wouldn't it be better if we just went back to the way things were before? If we went back to the world that we came from? They said one to another, let us make us a captain. They weren't happy with the captain they had. They had Moses already. They had Joshua, second in command. They said, let us make us a new leader. And let us return to Egypt. Let us find us a leader that will help lead and guide us back to the world where we were before. 
Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, here's the other character that's very prominent in the story, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes. What does that mean? They tore their clothing. This was one of the ways that they showed great sorrow. They were sad. They were mourning the way that the people were responding to the word of the Lord. And in great emotion, they ripped their clothes. And they spoke to the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. You know what? I mean, I don't. Ha I wish I had a piece of bread, but I don't have a piece of bread. But what he's trying to say, basically, I don't. I mean, in this case, doesn't look anything like bread. But what I'm trying to say is, could you imagine having a piece of bread in your hand, and if you just, especially a nice little soggy piece of bread, and you just barely, it took no force whatsoever to just rip that piece of bread. Basically, that's what he's saying. These people are like bread for the Lord. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more powerful than the God that we serve. Right. Even though it looks bad, even though the situation looks like it can't be overcome, I'm here to tell you that in the hands of God, they're nothing but bread. <laughs> Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade or wanted to stone them with stones. You hear, you hear what this guy's saying? He's saying that the, that the God we serve can beat these giants. What a fool! Grab some stones and let's pelt them in the head with it. That's what they were saying. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? You know, I can tell you right now that there's a possibility if you drive down the road and go to a different church, they're not going to preach this passage of Scripture the way, the way and I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm something special. I'm just saying the Lord always told me, just speak my word for the way that it's written. Most people don't want to hear that, though. Most people don't want to think about the gospel from God's perspective, how he views some of us in this place sometimes. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? When I'm preaching to you, I ain't just preaching to you. You got to remember something. I'm preaching to the preacher. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, is that the Lord said to Moses, how long will those people provoke me? How long will they? It's almost like they're like poking God. How, how far can I go? I'm going to aggravate you again. How long are you going to put up with me? Come on, Lord. What's going on here? How long will these people provoke me? How long will it be ere that they do not believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. Has God done anything in your life before? Praise God. Has God showed up for you? Amen. Yes. And done some things in your life that you knew it was the Lord. Has God made himself real to you? The only reason I ask you that is because I realize that sometimes people aren't yet convinced. I get that. Maybe we're all at different levels of our journey. But I do know this. God has showed up enough in my life to where he has convinced me that he's real. He has convinced me. He's shown me signs that he's real and that he wants to be there for me. Amen. Amen. This is what the Lord says that he's going to do. Not to the giants. To his own people. He said, I'm going to smite them with a pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of you a greater nation and mightier than what they were going to be. Now, this looks kind of rough on the surface, right? Oh, wow. God's turning from his people. He's going to throw them away. But I got to tell you that God's always moving in multiple directions at the same time. You think you're a multitasker? You ain't even. You, as soon as you think you're not caught up with the Lord, he's five steps ahead of you. He's swerving back to the left. He's fixing stuff over here, fixing stuff. And you're like, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is such a mess. And God's working the whole time and you can't even see what he's doing. What I'm trying to tell you is now this is part of a test for Moses. Because now he's like, these people, I'm going to disinherit them and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. What you think about that, Moses? Hello. See, the normal person would be like, oh, Lord, that sounds like a good plan. I'm about to get a promotion. I'm about to get a promotion. I'm about to get a raise. Yeah, them, them no good Israelites. I've been trying to tell them, Lord. I've been trying to tell them that you're holy. I've been trying to tell them that you love them and that you got a place for them. But they don't want to listen. And you know how frustrated I am because Lord knows if you think it's bad, God, I've been over here looking them in my eyeballs. And they don't want to listen to anything. That I'm trying to say to them. 
And the Lord said, well, I'm going to disinherit them, and I'll make you of a greater nation. I'll make, them might, and make you mightier than them. But this is Moses' response. His mother, you know, there's just something in you when you get saved and you let the Holy Spirit have His way in your heart. You just know whenever something arises that it just didn't quite right. You can't always put your finger on it, but you know when something's not quite right. You know what I'm getting at? And I'm just telling you, Moses, like, that ain't right. That ain't you. You've revealed yourself to me before God, and you've allowed me to see glimpses of you and who you are. And all I know is that what you just said right there is not lining up with your character. So this is what Moses responds. Moses said unto the Lord, don't do that, basically. Then the Egyptians will hear it. For you brought these people up in your power from among the Egyptians. And then they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. In other words, they're going to start broadcasting all this negative press about your people. If you destroy them, then the Egyptians are going to start talking to the other countries around them. And they're going to be saying, look at this guy that the Israelites serve. He, couldn't, he brought them out of Egypt, but then he couldn't even take care of them. And then they just, he just ended up destroying them and he gave up on them. I got good news for you, Christian. God didn't want to give up on you. Right. Even though sometimes you feel like turning your back on him and going back to Egypt and going back to your old way of life, I'm here to tell you, God doesn't want to disinherit you. God doesn't want to turn his back on you. Because, listen, God does not want his own name profaned. And let me just say this, too. Some of you are thinking, and I probably have this in my notes. I haven't even got to preaching yet. I'm still reading. Just bear with me. Some people are probably thinking, but you don't know about my past, preacher. You don't know how bad my past is. People won't let me go from my past. They keep bringing up my past. Guess what? There's a good chance that people will never allow your past to, to, to leave you. But I'm here to tell you the good news today that the Lord, amen, it matters what, how he sees you and it matters what he says about you. The world will always try to profane your name. The world will always try to beat you down and make you look bad. But I'm here to tell you, God sees you differently, amen, than what the world sees you as right. For they, the world, the Egypt, has heard that you are, that you, Lord, are among this people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and that your cloud stands over them, and that you go before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of, by, of fire by night. And now if you shall kill this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of you will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able. See, it brings God's name down. God wasn't able to deliver them. God wasn't able to set them free into the land which you swore unto them. Therefore, he has slain them in the wilderness. Now, Moses says, I, be, I beg you, Lord, let the power of my Lord be great according as you have spoken, saying, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy. That means he's patient with you. I want to tell you this morning that no matter what you're going through and whatever you're facing, even if you feel like you failed the Lord on multiple occasions, you need to understand that God is long suffering. Amen? Amen. He wants to be patient with you in this relationship. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee. The iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Amen. That goes back to the song. All the earth will praise his great name. God is in the process of bringing glory to his name. Amen. Amen. Basically, God is instructing Moses to send these spies into the land that he's promising to give them so that they can be prepared of what to expect. And in the end, they were able to determine that the place he was bringing them was full of blessings and promises of God. But on the other hand, there was also it was also full of obstacles. It was full of obstacles that and, and so now they had a choice that they had to make. How would they proceed? Would they continue to go forward in the plan of God or would they shrink back and go back to where they were before? Amen. Amen. Look at Mark chapter. Look at Mark chapter 10. Verse 38, because I got to tell you this morning that true Christianity involves both of these things. It says Peter began to say to him. We have left all and have followed you. See, sometimes it feels that way. 
I mean, a lot of th I don't know about you, but when I first started hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, I was big time into partying. And so in my mind, partying was the most important thing in my life. And whenever people were talking to me about Jesus, all I could think about was, yeah, but if I go here, that means I got to give all this up. As though all this was really something to hold on to. Because right. in reality, it was bringing destruction to my life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Peter's saying something, though. We decided to follow you, and we left everything that we had behind. We left our houses. We left our finances. We left all that behind, and we followed after you. And Jesus answered and said, Truthfully, I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. What is my point? My point is this. God has blessings prepared for his people even today in addition to tomorrow. But along with that, there's also persecutions on this side of glory. Persecutions and trials and tribulations. Frustrations that we will face. That sometimes will make us not want to endure. Not want to go on. But God is promising that there's hope in the midst of the story. Amen. Yeah. There's a lot to this story that we read this morning that correlates to the life of the modern Christian. Amen. God has a promise for a spiritual place of safety and freedom for the believer and the place of spiritual victory that God is promising isn't a place that is without obstacles or, or enemies. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, God purposefully allows giants to stay in the land because if you walked into the land of milk and honey and all there was was milk and honey and there was never a frustration, never an obstacle, never an enemy, we'd just be floating by on life and we would never really learn how to truly trust in the Lord in the midst of the frustrating circumstances that we're going through. But one of the things that I need you to know is, is that when you face these obstacles and these giants and these situations in your life, what is a giant? What could it be? It could be a lot of different things. Spiritual strongholds that you faced in the past. Sins that you keep going back towards. Relationship problems. All kind of different things going on in the midst of our life that we're facing that cause obstacles in our life. And what God's wanting you and I to learn how to do is to trust Him and to yeah. believe Him. And one of the things that you need to know is, is that the battle isn't yours to begin with. Hello. You can't beat the son of Anak by yourself. David couldn't kill Goliath by himself. No, it had to be the Spirit of the Lord going before young David. It has to be the Spirit of the Lord going before His people. Amen. Look what Isaiah 41 verse 10 says. In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 it says this. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. God is letting you know not to be confused. God wants, you, God wants his children to know not to be confused, not to be fearful, because he is the one that wants to give you and I strength. You see, the real problem that we're dealing with is that there's a battle of faith that's taking place. That's right. What we see with our physical eyes, the giants, the obstacles we the obstacles we face, they seem bigger than God. Am I preaching to anybody that knows what I'm talking about this morning? Amen. The obstacles in our lives seem bigger than the God that we serve. But that's just a perception. Amen? Amen. And they shake our resolve. They falter our faith. They cause us to question whether or not God can really do it. Can you really do it, God? You know, one of the things that I've said before, and I'll say it again, whether he does it or not, will you serve him? Amen. I mean, yes, he does show up and he does things and we got to continue to believe him. But I can assure you, they got a whole lot of churches filled with people and they put on a mask and they, they over there. Woo -hoo! Yes, the Lord is moving and everybody's acting happy. But when you see them on the backside and they're in their home, they're still going through things. And are they really holding on? I don't know. But the question for you this morning and the question for me this morning, even if he doesn't do it the way that I'm expecting him to do it, will I serve him till I have no breath left in my lungs because that is the purpose that he has created me for. And a lot of times when I get to that place in my walking in my life, he's willing to show up. 
Yeah. He's willing to show up and he's willing to take down one of them giants. Right. Oh, I just wish he'd take them all down, Lord. Take all them giants down at one time. That's not how I'm going to do it, son. I'm not going to take them all down at one time. You're going to trust me one giant at a time, one obstacle at a time. And if you trust me, hallelujah, I'm going to get you through. See, sometimes the problem lies with us. See, I, whenever we look at these obstacles, whatever they may be, the mounting bills we can't pay, unresolvable relationship issues that we have, the fact that we can't change the behavior and the decisions of our children, the economic situation that we face, problems on the job, all of these things, giants, giants, sons of Anak, walled cities, strongholds, all of these things that we face. Sometimes the problem lies with us. Maybe we made bad choices that have affected the relationship, the children, the job. But sometimes it's just that there are spiritual obstacles and giants that are allowed in the path of our journey for the sole purpose of testing our faith. Is, do you see the God that you serve that way? Does that make him a mean God to you? That he would test your faith? That he would put you in a trial or a situation to test your faith? I hope that that doesn't make him seem mean to you. Because he's not mean. He's a loving God. Amen. And many times we think that we know the right way for ourselves. And in reality, we don't. And he loves us enough that he gave us a free will. Right. And he says to us, if this is the way you want to go, I'm going to allow you. It might hurt my heart, but I'm going to allow you to go. And then when you realize that you went away, that it wasn't good for you, I'm going to be waiting right here yeah, for you. Amen. 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 Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. See, I want you to see. This is the Lord. This is after the wilderness too. This is when he's about to bring them in to the promised land. But I want you to see what the Lord says about the wilderness. See, the wilderness is whenever you're facing the obstacles. The wilderness is that place when you're frustrated and you're not really entering into where God, where you believe God would have you to be. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or no. Isn't that something? God allows you to go through things to prove to you. And you know the word prove means to put you to the test. It's kind of like a, a person that works with metals. And, and, is, and is testing the purity of a metal. When you put the fire to the metal and you get it hot enough, all the impurities start to bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop. They come to the top where the, where the refiner can see it and he begins to scrape it away. So the wilderness experience is kind of like fire to metal, to put the metal to the test, to put the believer to the test, to reveal to them what is in their heart. See, you don't have to come clean with me. That's, that's, another, that's another religion where you go talk to somebody like that. You don't need, you, you and I have to come clean with him. Amen. Amen. You, you and I, whenever we find ourselves in the midst of this trial and this tribulation and we, and we find ourselves in the midst of this wilderness and the Lord is putting us to the test and he's revealing to us the things that are in our own heart. What he's saying is, won't you come to me? Can we reason together? Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be made white as snow. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus will make you white again. The blood of Jesus Jesus will bring, bring purity to your life. God's trying to get us to line up with him. Amen. Amen. Yes. He said, and he humbled you, whether you would keep his commandments, and he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you knew not. Neither did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, of, of the Lord does man live. Your raiment or your clothing did not get old upon you. Your feet didn't swell these 40 years. You shall also consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord God also chastens you. You know what that means? Just like a daddy, I'm just saying, like, whatever your persuasion of discipline is, I'm not telling you how to do it. I can tell you what the Word of God says. This is a daddy brings correction to his child and he might spank him and he sits him down and he tells him, no, you don't go that way. Why? Because I already know the pathway that you're going. Don't you understand that as an adult, I have wisdom. Now you got to be careful how you say that because if you frustrate them and you, you try to, you got to, you want to, you want to be kind. You want, you want them to be convinced that you're, that you're doing it for love for them and that you're just not being some harsh, whatever. But nevertheless, you know some things they don't know. Right. Do you not? Hello. I'm not going to even sit here and tell you all the crazy things I did. <laughs> Whenever I did things against what my what to rebel against my father. Because I was mad at him. I didn't know that's what it was. 
but all of the things that I did. And then now, as I'm older, I'm yes, obviously I'm not God, but I see God has foreknowledge. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to explain something to you. God has foreknowledge. He knows every step of the way before you and I ever get there. And he's trying to lead and guide us down the path. I don't have foreknowledge, but I have some wisdom because I went down some wrong paths that caused pain in my life. So as a father, I tried to chasten or bring correction to my children to prevent them from going in the direction that was going to get them in trouble. I'm just saying, dude, when you when you break the law, you end up in detention home or something. It's not fun. The food there is horrible. And that's just one little aspect. I am not going to get into all the details. I'm just saying, like, I know this. If you do this and you get caught doing this, you will end up here. Trust me when I tell you. And so I chasten you. I bring correction to you. And sometimes chasten. I don't like chastening. I don't like nobody telling me what I'm supposed to do. I don't want nobody. I don't even like this preacher because of the way he preaches. It's always bringing correction. I'm just reading to you the word of the Lord. I don't like being corrected. I don't like the way it makes me feel. Who does? My friend, we all got pride issues. None of us like to hear when we're going in the wrong direction. Let's just let the word of the Lord bring chastening. I don't like chastening. Okay, well, look what the book of Hebrews says right here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says this, no chastening, no correction for the present at the present time seems joyous. Nobody likes it, right? But instead grievous, it brings sorrow sometimes and pain. Nevertheless, afterward, what does it do? It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised Thereby, So when the word of the Lord brings correction to our life or when a child submits to the correction of a parent, guess what? In the long run, it will bring joy and peace and happiness. So the essence to our story out of numbers is that we have God's people on a journey that the Lord has sent them on. It's a journey specifically prepared to test their faith. A test to see whether or not they will believe that he is able to do what his word says he can do. It's also a test to see whether they really want what he's offering. Amen. That's why I say, which side are you on? Do you really want what the Lord's offering? Because I'm just saying, dude, there's a whole modern church out there that is off. And, and I mean, you may not. But who, who is this guy think he is that he's saying that something's wrong with those big old church? I'm not saying every church is a problem. What I'm saying is there is a different when you know the word of God. When you study it and you read the word of God and you hear what some preachers are saying, you will begin to realize that what they're saying isn't lining up with this right here. That's right. Amen. I mean, they write a book, Your Best Life Now. Sorry, buddy. That ain't the truth. Because if that was the case, that means we'd get the whole inheritance on this side and there would be nothing waiting us on, on the other side. If that was the truth, there wouldn't be no giants in this land. If that was the truth, it would just be easy sailing, my friend. And you're trying to... You're trying trying to sell me a bill of goods and you just put money in your pocket and most people like the way you're saying it because whenever you say it you make them feel warm and fluffy on the inside and they don't feel like they've been chasing by the Lord but ain't nobody gonna be able to grow up in the real Christianity like that and we're just gonna float through and get frustrated like the children of Israel turn around and want to go back to Egypt that's not gonna fly that's not gonna work so point number one you ready we gotta hustle up which side are you on who are you walking with this morning? Are you walking with the big old crowd, the numerous multitude that began to murmur and complain and said, let's pick up stones and let's stone them because look at what they're saying. They're crazy and they're trying to say that we can overcome these giants. Is that who, is that who you're with in the camp? Are you with that group of people? Or are you with these two right here? You know, look, for sake of time, I'm just going to share this with you. One of the things that I noticed about these two characters, these two main characters, Joshua and Caleb. I love these two characters. You know what the name Joshua means? That's actually the Hebrew version of the name Jesus. Yeshua. The word Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. Ultimately, whenever God brings the children of Israel from the wilderness into the promised land, Joshua is the leader. Joshua is a type of Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Jesus, Jesus is our deliverer. Jesus is the one that went before us and went to the cross and paid the penalty of our sin so that the Holy Spirit can strengthen us and bring us to the place that God has planned for us. And listen, you know what the word Caleb means? Check this out. Now, you got you to gotta look at the whole definition, but literally the word means dog. <laughs> but, the, but the adjective that used to describe it is forcible. What does it mean? It means like a dog in a fight that won't quit. You ever seen a dog that ain't got no quit in it? it, it I mean, some dogs, they get bit one time and they like, and they, and they take off running the other way. Some dogs are just like, dude, they just br- they'll just stay in that fight. They won't quit. They won't quit. They'll just take that beating. That's what the idea behind his name is. I will not quit. Yeah. And so here, here he is linked with the arms of Jehovah is salvation. Caleb, to me, represents the type of the believer that says, I will not quit. I'm going to walk with Yeshua. I'm going to walk with Joshua. And no matter what I see, I might see giants in the land, but I'm going to say, no, no, those giants are bred for the God that I serve. And instead, what I see is them big old grapes, and I see the honey dripping from the trees, and I see them goats running around. I can't wait to give me some of that milk. And instead, I'm going to believe God. He's going to get me through which side are you on whose team are you on amen are you going to be with the murmurs and the complainers and believe that god can't get you through are you going to stand and walk with the lord amen and in spite of what you face hold on to jesus i want to encourage you church hold on to jesus Listen to me right now. We're all fired up, or at least some of us are. We're fired up. Y'all are fired up. I know you are. I've just already talked too much. Y'all are fired up. We're feeling the presence of the God. We're seeing the word of the Lord. Tomorrow might tell a different story. Come on. Whenever the enemy starts coming up, the sons of Anak are like, yeah, you heard what that preacher said yesterday, but now you got to face me. Guess what? We're going to lock arms with Joshua. Hallelujah. And we're going to say, I'm going to keep on walking with the Lord, and I'm going to trust God. That's the side that I'm on. Amen. I like that fact that he won't give up because in Numbers 14, 24, this is what the Lord said. But my servant, Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and has followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went and his seed shall possess it. Caleb was operating under a different spirit than all the, they all called themselves Christians, if you could let me use a little quotation mark. What I'm saying is they all called themselves the believers of God. They were all Israelites. They had all come through the Red Sea. They were all calling themselves Hebrews. They all said that they served God. But Caleb was the only one that had a different spirit. Caleb was the only one that had the same report as Joshua. And God said, I'll give it to him. God wants to give you the blessings of the new covenant, amen, and it's found in Jesus. That was point number one. Which side are you on? Point number two. Everyone in the story is facing the same thing. It's just that they see it differently. Right. Amen? Amen. I mean, for sake of time, the people are strong. The cities are walled. But Caleb said, shh. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people. They are stronger than us. We saw the giants, the son of Anak, and they they come from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. I remember I preached a message, one of the first messages I ever preached. I was actually still going to Cornerstone Ministry. You talk about back in the gap. That was a long time ago. Jimmy Duhon let me preach a message. And I was, remember I was reading this story and I preached, are you a grape taster or a grasshopper? <laughs> you're going to take a hold of that fruit and eat that grape or you're going to be a grasshopper? How do you see yourself in the eyes of the Lord? This is a very powerful thought. We saw the giants, which came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers. See, their enemy viewed them a certain way and the result was that they viewed themselves the same way listen real quick I just want to say something I talked about it a little bit earlier every last one of us in this place have a past every last one of us in this place have something that we're probably ashamed of and if you don't if you never if you if you sitting there thinking oh no preacher I ain't never done nothing wrong com- compared to my neighbor over here well guess what buddy you got the wrong attitude and you're probably in the wrong place because you're self-righteous and you fool the Lord don't look at it like that amen we've all fallen short of the glory of God Amen. 
And what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that you can't allow the enemy to tell you that you're a grasshopper. I mean, you don't believe that. Don't because, listen, the word out on the street is going to never change. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they say they got religion, but you should have known so and so back in the day. Guess what? I got in a conversation with somebody a couple of years ago, <laughs> and I mean, the person was like, dude, you're a drug addict. I'm like, well, hold on a second. <laughs> like, oh, that's not what the word of God says. The word of God says I'm a new creation in Christ. Yes. And, and, and the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that the world's always going to try to tell us that we were. And listen, I'm not trying to pick on anything, but I'm just going to shoot straight with you. I had to go to AA back in the day. And I had to go, and I'm not trying to pick on AA. If you're in AA, that's between, that's you and your, your thing. But what I'm trying to say, what AA is, is contrary to the word of God. And don't get mad at me for saying that. AA says, you got to say your name. My name is Matt and I'm an alcoholic. That's what I got. That's my confession. Every time I go to a meeting, my name is Matt and I'm a drug addict. No, hold on. That's not what the word of the Lord says. Right. The word of the Lord says you're a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, I got that scripture right here. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Listen, how do you see yourself? The word of the Lord says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look at Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead will dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken or bring life to your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. You might have been dead before, but the same spirit that rose Jesus up from the physical dead can raise you up, hallelujah, from the spiritual dead. And he can infuse you with life and he can give you strength and ain't no giant on this earth that can Fight the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You're not a grasshopper. Amen. You are you're a giant in Christ. Romans 8:37 says this: Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Neither death nor hell, nor angels, nor sorrow, no sadness, none of that, the apostle Paul said, can keep us out of the hand of our God. Amen. God's got a plan for your life. Point number three. When things don't go the way that we expected, plan B is not an option. Mm. Let me say that again. Uh, I'm not even going to give you point four for time. Just bear with me. Point, point, point three. When things don't go the way that we expected. Oh, I just thought all I was going to do was eat honey and drink milk all day. No, and eat them big old grapes. No. That's not true Christianity. This is not your best life now. To return the book. Tell them you want your money back. It's not the truth. Is there joy? Is there pleasure? Is there happiness? Yes, there is in Christ. But when things don't go out the way we expected, plan B is not an option. See, all the children of Israel, they murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation. And we, oh, I wish we would have died in Egypt. I wish we would have died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us into this land? Let us make us another captain. Get us another leader. And I'm just telling you right now, I believe with all of my heart that that's much of what we're experiencing in the modern church. People that don't really want to hear what the true word of the Lord is saying. And so they find for themselves the word of God says it. I didn't say it. It says in the end days, they will heap to themselves preachers having itching ears. The word itching ears means they want to hear pleasant words. And they're going to heap piles of these kinds of preachers to themselves. And they're going to run from pile to pile to pile till they find the one that tells them the things that they want to hear. Because a lot of times people don't want to hear what the word of the Lord really says. And whenever a preacher will stand for the truth and begin to tell you... And and sometimes there's chastening involved in that. And it shows you things in your own life or in my life that aren't right. We don't like the way that it feels. And we say, no, I want to forge forward and go according to my plan. So in order to do that, you got to find yourself a new captain. you got to find yourself a new leader. We want one that will bring us, to this, bring us back to Egypt. And so we have churches, I'm just saying... I'm not, I'm not, if you go to a church like that, sometimes I'm not picking on your church. If you go to a church and you're watching the video, I'm not really picking on your church, but I guess in a way I am. If your church has got an entertainment spirit, 
and you got all these special little lights and the band is everybody's looking groovy and you almost feel like you kind of could have been in the club. You're not real sure. You, you, and I'm kind of like confused here. I'm just not real sure. I mean, the music sounds a little bit different than the club. The bass isn't hitting quite as hard, but it kind of reminds me a little bit like a club. I kind of feel comfortable here because like I always used to feel comfortable in a club. I kind of like this place. It's real dark. Everybody can't see my face and all this other kind of stuff like that. What I'm trying to say is, dude, that's a problem. Yeah. You might have found yourself a captain that said, hey, it's okay for us to go back a little bit more towards Egypt. No, it's not. It's not okay for us to water down the gospel. It's not okay. The word of God says that he has chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. I used to go... I used to be connected to some people that I know that they love the Lord. And so if you happen to still watch every now and then, I know you love the Lord. But you were wrong when you said we'll never change the method, the message, but we might change the method. And then they said, hey, as a matter of fact, we changed the method. Right now, the youth pastor's over there speaking to your kids in a language they understand. Wiki, wiki, wiki. <laughs> so what you're trying to tell me is, is that the language that my children need to understand is some dude hitting it on the turntable, some DJ, ooh, yeah, 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 we in the house, uh-huh, so now we're going to pump it up. We're going to give you some Jesus up in here. Wiki, wiki, wiki. Yeah, they understand. No, that's the language of the world. That's not the language of Jesus. And if we don't understand the language of Jesus, then we need to make our study ourselves to show ourselves approved. Hello. Amen. No, we, you can't change the method and hold on to the message. Hello. It sounds good. That sounds like a good thing, but it's not reality. Find myself a captain and bring me back to Egypt. We better be careful, church. That's right. I'm just saying, look, I don't want to be the guy that's full, so full of rules and regulations that we live in under the law. But at the same time, I don't want to be the guy that buys the lie and says we can do what everybody else is doing. That's okay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Amen. Jesus.